Hey everyone. So hopefully I'm live here right now. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining me tonight. I'm really excited to finally get into the tiling process here. Today is going to be uh, finishing, actually getting into the tile work here. I thought I was going to get into yesterday's episode on that, but we're going to get it into today. So this is really uh, the fun part of this project. This is a seven day bathroom remodel that I did in real live time this summer. And I basically recorded everything and I'm creating a course out of it. So this is going to be day four, part two. This is basically the second half of the day uh, that we're going to be getting into. So let's get right into it. Um, if there's anybody in the chat, okay, thanks, babe. Just want to make sure that we were live. Uh, it looks like I'm finally getting the hang of this. Uh, so... Yeah, so yesterday, if you missed the live stream, check out my YouTube channel. You really want to uh, check out the last video if you missed it because we really go over some of the really important things that are going to help you um, get into tiling and be less frustrated. So choosing the right thin sets for what you're using and getting all the equipment and the tools to set it properly and make it easy on yourself. I can't express that enough that using a very good thin set will really make a huge difference with uh, the ease of the process. And again, if you're kind of new at this, you're gonna want a thin set that's gonna last a long time and not flash on you. So uh, at, you know, as you're here getting in here, please give me a like on this video, it really helps out the algorithm. If you're watching this later, you might wanna fast forward these next 10 minutes because I'm gonna go through the entire project that we have up to date here. Um, and you know what? Honestly, it's not a bad idea to, to refresh your memory on this and get this in your in your mind on how you're going to go about accomplishing the bathroom. Because my main goal here is just to show you basically my experience of how to remodel a bathroom and give you, uh, you know, really some uh, guidance on how to get it done efficiently. I know a lot of DIYers, this is a space that's going to be kind of an intimidating space, especially if you don't have more than one bathroom in your home. This can be a very intimidating project because your family is counting on you to get it finished. So that's the whole goal of my channel. The whole goal of this course is to get you organized. So you might want to keep stay on here, but if you already watched this many times, skip through 10 minutes and you'll uh, we'll get you know we'll be getting into the form that we're we're looking at. Um, so let me just get to this recap to show you exactly where we're at. And just to let you know, this is basically the bathroom. This is a standard bathroom, a five by eight bathroom, just has a tub, a standard tub, toilet, vanity. So nothing tremendously uh, overwhelming, but the big thing that we did here is that we ended up tearing out everything and redoing everything. So I'm gonna go over this uh, estimate with everyone. At some point, this was, basically the estimate that I gave to the client to do the job and really just wanted to um, kind of go over this stuff. Now, obviously when you're in different areas of the country, you know, you have different living expenses and things cost more, but this is roughly what a standard bathroom costs from a contractor between 12 and 15,000 is pretty normal for a five by eight bathroom. Now it always depends on what kind of vanity you're getting or what kind of towel you're using. Um, but you know, for the most part, I would say that's roughly what today's standards are between, you know, 12 and 15,000 for a standard bathroom. Now, obviously, if you're in a, um, you know, New York City or something, it might be a lot more. But we'll go over that at some point here on a live stream, and I'd love to get some feedback on it. This whole in live interaction, I'm really... Uh, I'm really hoping we get some interaction and you can um, ask me questions. I'll pause the video and do um, and, and go over any of the questions that you have. So let's get into the recap real quick here. So this is what the existing bathroom was. This was a 1970s bathroom. Let me shrink myself down here a little bit too. Okay. So I'll just roughly, there is no sound on the actual video here. I'm just going to be kind of narrating over the process so that you know what we've done on those first four days before we get into the actual tiling process. So I'm going to check here in the live chat before I get started here too, see who's on there. Okay. Troy, hey, good to see you. Um, is the price on a contractor charges or just materials in general? No, that's, that's, that's the con. I mean, that was my price with, um, 
no, that's not even the, no, I X'd out of that. Anyways, 12 to 15,000 is usually hiring somebody to do it. Now, if you're doing a walk-in shower, something like that, it definitely increases the cost because you've got, you know, a glass enclosure primarily. Um, and also just building a shower is just more costly than a tub surround for sure. So, um, but I can answer more questions about that later. I can bring that estimate back up and we can dus discuss things later, but let's just go over this process again. I think it's really important for you to kind of memorize the pattern of what's going on here and what you want to accomplish every day is really important to have your, you know, your ducks in a row before you get started into a bathroom where you can prolong this. I've seen it happen. I've seen a lot of, uh, people that I've taught take months and months and months to get it done. And it's just because they run out of steam. They go to home Depot and it just screws up their whole day and they only get a couple of things done. So that's the whole purpose of this course is to get you organized and get you set. So this is kind of the recap of what it is. And this is a, a like I said, a 1970s bathroom. It's a, uh, a split entry home. So it's a pretty common scenario. So as you can see, it's pretty well outdated, uh, beautiful wallpaper here and a lot of, uh, well, you know what, actually, let me just pause that right there. When I first went in here, because she took the, the 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 client took the mirror down when I first got there, right here. So you see where that outlet is, and then you see this little patch here. That right there was a sign to me that I want. I definitely wanted to take the walls down. There was definitely some goofy wiring going on there, and um, because that's not a normal setup. Somebody obviously added that at a later point. But signs like that makes you you know question what's behind those walls. And then when I see wallpaper like that, forget it. I'm not, I'm not even touching it. It's getting completely ripped out and I'm doing new drywall. And I think a lot of you, if you have touched wallpaper, um, you probably regretted it and never wanted to do it again. So I never play around with wallpaper. I just take it all the way down to the studs and use new drywall. It actually is a lot easier and more efficient to do that way. And, and I'll be repeating that a lot throughout all these courses about, you know, that it's really important if you're doing a full bathroom remodel to gut everything so that you can see all that plumbing and electrical. So this was a pretty standard kind of tub and shower that you would have back then. Um, steel tub four by four tile. First thing you want to do though, shut off that water. And then we want to remove the toilet and the vanity. This is mainly just to get some space into the bathroom. I go over, you know, these valves, you have to be careful with these valves. That's why you want to shut the water off because most of the time these valves don't even turn off at all. And as soon as you touch them, they leak. So this is a thing that you really want to have prepared beforehand is making sure that you have shut off valve or uh, caps so that you can cap the water and get the water back in the home. Um, next step is to get this drain assembly ap apart so that you don't get a lot of dirt and debris into your existing plumbing. It did not work out. Most of the time it doesn't, especially when they're 30 years old like this. So the next best thing is to actually just cut that tailpiece out below. Moving on to the tub surround. At this point, I do have the water turned back onto the home. Um, clients definitely get anxious about not having water in their home. And then just basically removing the tub surround. Now, this is going to be something that varies in every bathroom. It might be a lot more difficult than what I just had there. That was literally over plaster. Um, a couple other things you want to keep in mind is to have a temporary light fixture that you could put in, especially if you don't have a window in the home. So having that on hand before you start the bathroom is helpful so that you can get a light on in the bathroom. Um, but we go into obviously really detailed information here in the course about going about this. But again, I like to get rid of all of that plastic or all of the, the drywall and get it out of the room. It's just going to make everything easier as far as installing process as we go through. But uh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, nor normally like the, the big demo, like all this demo is usually done before lunch. And then I like to get in. A new vent fan so taking out that ceiling helps out to get a new vent fan in you're not crawling in an attic space trying to do it one of my favorites is the panasonic whisper line uh, i've always had really great success with those vent fans i highly recommend them i have a whole bunch of videos on my youtube channel about installing them but this course definitely outlines on how that's done and then i really like to have the ceiling hung on that first day as well because that really takes the anxiety away from the client they're not looking into their attic not worrying about bats and <laughs> and mice and everything and then you go into uh the plumbing now this is an area that will most likely take more time than you anticipate because it's really tough to tell 
what there is until you start tearing everything out. So even as a contractor, I have, I have, you know, obviously I have a bunch of experience, um, but you never really know what you're getting into until you pull that tub and you pull out that subfloor. Uh, this was a copper, and then this is a drum trap on this one. And drum traps, you definitely want to replace. But I really would recommend, no matter what kind of trap you have, that you replace. Because, you know, most of the time, it's been there for a very long time. It probably is not very easily to be snaked. These drum traps are almost impossible to snake. So you definitely want to get rid of them and just start out with a new P-trap for your tub. It'll also make you actually installing that tub in a drain assembly much easier. So there's a lot of different ways of going about it. Not everyone's going to have the same situation. But in this one, it actually um, you know, turned out to be a pretty simple process. But this is where you know these first two days is really where you find the problems and what might take you a lot more time to accomplish. And then, hey, that's kind of where why I'm here. If you buy into my course, you can always ask a question and I can try to help, um, you know, problem solve the situation that you have. Um, but you're not really going to know that until you actually tear out the bathroom and find out what's there. So we're basically just addressing this plumbing, getting taking a look at it. And then I like to adapt to it before I even set the tub. Makes it a lot easier when you're doing that. And then you want to put new subfloor down if you need to. And then again, like I said, I'm putting this Fernco on, getting that plumbing prep before I even install the tub. Now keep in mind, when you're installing a tub, it usually takes two to three times or three to four times to actually install that tub of dry fitting it, making sure everything sits right. But if you install the drain assembly before you set the tub and you're by yourself, it's gonna make it a lot, lot easier. And I, uh, I really have a lot of great tips here, but I, I am a real big fan of silicone for tubs. You just have to be sure that your manufacturer allows um, silicone to be used, but I found it to be a very um, leak-free way to go. But again, putting that drain assembly up when the tub is up, much easier on your back. You know, you're not cramped in a little space trying to put that together. And then you want to dry fit to make sure that that ledger board's in the right location. Not all tubs have ledger boards, so make sure you pay attention to the specs of the tub that you install. I like to get the trap arm in place before I set the tub. That, again, will make it easier to connect the plumbing. So you install the tub per the manufacturer's instructions. This one had uh, washers and screws that were made to actually put that together. And then you can go ahead and put your trap and glue that in so this really makes it easy you can see how i just kind of glue it and then stick it into the uh, drain assembly as there and then you move on to the tub surround or into the tub shower faucet i have a lot of great details in my course on how to even make this even easier than what i'm showing you here um, now again all these methods that i'm showing you is primarily what I've been doing for the last 14 years. So I've been a contractor here in Pittsburgh for about 22 years now. I started my company when I was 21. And, um, you know, my, I might be repeating myself because if, if you've been watching, you know, you, you, you've heard me talk about this before. But I'm really basically showing you the most efficient, effective way to get this done. There's, all, there's so many different ways of going about this, but I found that the PEX A with the crimps and then um, using a Delta shower faucet is one of the easiest. I mean, I would pretty much say Delta, Moen, and Kohler are all pretty much similar fashion of installing. But I, I am a real big fan of the Delta faucets. They really haven't changed in the entire time that I've been installing uh, showers. And, it, it, you know, it's, I've never really had an issue. So I'm a real big fan of them. But uh, it really makes it easy for installation when you're using the PEX. Uh, that is something that, you know, these last 15 years um, has made plumbing and everything else so much easier than having to solder and, um, you know, do copper for everything. So you want to get that, that rough in valve in place and get your tub, um, you know, basically get that tub and shower faucet set, test everything and fill everything up with water. So this is this is a big day. This day number two is a big day. This is gonna make you feel really good to have water running again in your home. And then moving on to framing and blocking. This is the next day, this is the third day. And this is really important uh, to make sure that, you know, this is the time that you wanna spend the time to make the bathroom. Um, well, let me put it this way. If you're going to go the extra mile in any fashion in here, not not just buying like a, a high end fixture or a high end faucet, but I'm saying about um, making things easier for the rest of the installation of the project. This blocking, uh, framing, and and um, making sure that everything's 
has a flat surface is going to make the towel installation easier if you have blocking for your towel bars you'll be able to screw your 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 accessories in with no problem you're not going to get any callbacks because you know a towel bar came out of place i can't tell you how many times i wasted a couple hours out of my day having to run over you know six months later because a towel bar fell out so having the blocking in place thinking about those things really helps out a lot um, but again a lot of these older homes the walls aren't exactly flat especially if you had a plaster home they were really far out and they didn't really care because they were just plastering everything and making it level with the plaster um, but when you're doing these wall boards especially the foam board for your uh, tub surround um, backer board it's important to get that wall fairly flat and i'm just saying that within reason if everything's within a quarter inch you know honestly that's that is good enough and you'll be able to overcome any of that difference when you're actually getting into uh, the tiling process or anything else for that matter. So a third day is another big day though. Um, make sure you put nail plates over all of your plumbing. You don't wanna be putting screws or nails into that and having to bust into that later on. Um, I've been there before, so nail plates are cheap. Uh, so here you can see that I'm shimming out all the walls. This is gonna allow me to get that backer board over top of the tub flange. I find this to be the easiest way to go. And again, when you remove all the drywall in the, in the room, it makes this whole process easier. Here I'm putting some blocking in for those towel bars and accessories. So I'll be able to screw that right in. We get into the hanging of the drywall and I usually like to do that before lunch. So I like to have hanging the drywall and putting that first coat of mud on, take lunch and then move on to the waterproofing the tub surround. Um, so I give you a lot of great tips on finishing. Um, a lot of this stuff, it does, it is difficult. It's not something that you pick up right away. Um, but drywall mudding and stuff, it just, it might take you a bunch of coats to get to what the, 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 the pattern that you want it. It does take experience to get used to it. Um, and, uh, you know, I've done a lot of drywall. I've, I've, I've sheeted my, you know, many homes because, you know, when I was flipping homes, um, I just couldn't afford to have some of this stuff done. So, you know, I, I've definitely, um, installed probably over my career, thousands of sheets of drywall. Um, but there's obviously many different methods of going about this and I'm not going to claim to be the neatest and the best, you know, most professional way of going about it. There's many, many tools that, uh, a lot of drywall professionals use that make this a lot easier and, and a lot flatter. Um, but when you're talking about six sheets of drywall, it's not a big deal. And it's really, really tough to find a contractor to just come in and do six sheets of drywall. It's just usually would be too costly because of the time reference of going back and forth between coats and everything. It's just impossible to find anybody to do it. I've tried. So, um, so that's kind of why, you know, I was kind of self-taught to a certain extent, followed a bunch of, um, you know, I, I hired people that were doing drywall work and, and basically learned from them. But there are a lot of great newer tools that make this a lot easier. But the methods that I show you here, you should be successful with it. And it's something that you can just keep touching up to make perfect. Uh, it just takes more time for it to dry. So, yeah, get that first coat on. This is obviously a time sensitive thing because you want to uh, have that dry so that the next following day you can actually get the second coat on as well. So getting that first coat of drywall mud is a um, time timing thing that you want to have prepared if you're trying to do this within seven days. And then fourth day, this is the beginning of the fourth day. So tile layout starts. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the no, this, this is still third day. I'm sorry. <laughs> I get behind myself on this. Um, so that drywall work and the, the stuff was done before lunch. After that, that's when I start my tiling process uh, or thought process behind the tile because I'm going to be putting a recessed niche in and you want to kind of really have a good idea of maybe where your tile layer is going to be working. So I always do this too because it gets my mind going about the tile work and then I can kind of maul on it and think about it and um, but at this at this rough in framing stage it's really important just so that you kind of have an idea of where your your tile layer is going to be so that you can uh, make that niche bigger than it needs to be um, i always do recommend making those niches you know an inch bigger than where you think the tile layer is going to be because you can always build up and and make that niche smaller you just can't make it bigger so keep that in mind but i have a lot of great tips in here on um you know, what to consider when you're actually doing the tiling work. 
uh, and then the day four, we go even in more process, you know, or even more thought on, on how the tile layout is going to work. So just cutting that out frame, you know, I like to use these corner niches a lot. These things are great because it kind of hides all your soaps and everything. And it's a really nice functional place for a good location. Then we move into the waterproofing. So this is um, go board. This is a foam board. There's no dust. It's just you cut with a utility knife. I've been really happy using this product and it's really easy and it's, it's fairly inexpensive. You're talking maybe uh, 25 bucks a sheet. Now the sealant costs more. So, I mean, typically on a tub surround, you'll probably be about between three and $400 to actually waterproof it, um, depending on what system you go with. Even with the, if you use cement board, cement board is not waterproof. You have to waterproof cement board. So you're adding a layer, either a liquid membrane or you're doing something like a Schluter membrane going over that. So really, most of the time, all tub surrounds are going to be between three and $400 for waterproofing. And this go board is right in that level. And again, I, I really find it to be an easy system. The other system I really do like is Weedy. Um, they make some really great wall panels, but it's definitely almost double the cost on that. I would say a tub surround with Weedy is going to be about $600. Um, but it is a great product and I really highly recommend it. But the, uh, the go board is, board is definitely taking over the market, I think, and to a certain extent because because of the affordability and the fact that it's really easy to waterproof with the sealant application. So you're just using regular door rock screws. And like I said, I, I have that um, furring strips to allow that board to go over that tub flange. That makes it nice and easy. Um, but, you know, basically rule of thumb for go board is just having sealant in between each joint and going over all the screw holes now making a custom niche is also really awesome because you can just use some of that extra board that you have with the project to make your own custom niche um and uh yeah i mean it's it really is a user-friendly product so um i'm not a I'm not a go board salesman but i just uh I, i'm just really happy with how quickly i can get this done because like i said this is after launch so i'm basically having the whole tubs around waterproof and really, in reality, like if, if you were in a big time crunch and say if that plumbing took you two more days than you thought it was going to take you and you only had one week off to do this, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm willing to put my neck out there and tell you that I, I, you will be able to get a somewhat functional bathroom by the end of week one. If you have this waterproofing up, you can easily just put the cartridge in your shower valve and put a shower head up and use that tub and shower there's no reason that you couldn't really the tile work is just a decorative part of the project and it really has other than the value of you know aesthetics and looking great um you know the waterproofing behind the tile is what really makes this bathroom last a long time so you know if, even if you just got the waterproofing and your tub in and in the faucet in you can get your bathroom back to a functional use and then you know, take another week off or take, you know, do it on the weekends at that point. Um, so, you know, then that's, you know, again, the course is going to guide you through this and, and then, you know, should be able to, to achieve this in a, in a timely fashion. So then you just, uh, yeah, the, the niche does take a lot of sealant. Um, you know, I would definitely order one or two tubes, uh, just for the niche uh, because you don't want to run out. That's really annoying to, to run out of sealant on this tub surround. I basically use six sheets of go board and then about 10 tubes of sealant. And then I had a box of door rock screws to screw everything. So it's 25 bucks a sheet. It's not that bad. You know, I think it was about 360 bucks for this entire tub surround. And then you just go with the application over top of all those screws. Like I said, the rule of thumb is one inch overlap of all the seams and all the screws. And uh, again, this is the time frame that you can, the next morning, you can use the shower if you really had to. And then the plumbing wall, this was a little bit of a different scenario. Since this drywall right here was, there was a door um, that you exited out of the bathroom. And you don't want to be putting uh extension jams on the inside of your door because every time that you go closing your door the latch will hit the hit the trim and then it will be wearing off your paint so you always want to have 
the inside of your door frame straight up against those studs. So in this scenario, and I mean, you could obviously cut out the door and move it in if you had to and put the extension jams on the outside of the door, but this is definitely going to be a lot easier. And, and, and as a contractor, I'm just, all I'm doing is the bathroom. I didn't get contracted to, you know, repair the rest of the home. So what I needed to do was to keep this, um, backer board above the tub rim so it didn't bellow out and then we're going to be filling that with the sealant so it's a really easy process to do it this way as well and you could do this all the way around the tub if you had to but again i really would recommend shimming out the walls and allowing that backer board to go over the flange so you can see there i just fill in that tub gap that will take up some more sealant as well i'm <laughs> about a tube right there uh, but this is not just a, any like sil it's not silicone it's it's a it's a it's a it's a polyurethane type of base i'm not exactly sure what it's made out of but it's it's made to be able to do this so this is um you know a proper way that go board wants you to go about doing it and it's really important to bring that waterproofing down alongside the tub I, I i find that to be one common area that you always have wear and tear so bringing that go board down along the tub is really important and if you want to add some extra insurance is put these shower valve seals on that'll make sure especially the tub spout i would say the tub spout is really really important putting one of these gaskets on because this is you know most tub spouts they don't have any type of um seal to the tile it literally just is backed up to the towel and there's a gap and now a lot of tubs that i tear out i see a big caulk joint around it because water's getting behind the tub spout and then dripping into the wall behind that's where putting one of these pipe seals on will eliminate that problem but this is a schluter uh, pipe seal and valve seal and i used a curdy fix to adhere it and the other thing you want you can notice is that i used uh, this curdy membrane between the drywall and the go board. So you can just thin set this down. Now this is definitely going to be outside of the tile area, but I think it's really important to have everything waterproof from the, uh, from the tile layer all the way in. And then you can just simply mud over anything that's excess. And I always mud over after I get my towel installed because most of the time when you're tiling you have a thin set layer underneath of it so the tile kind of bumps out a little bit and it makes a kind of a gap on the edge so feathering it out with um, mud over top of that curdy band really uh, makes a nice joint and it's a, it's a smaller caulk, caulk joint on the actual bull nose or whatever type of edging you're going to be using so that's basically the um, wrap up of the waterproofing, as you can see. And then moving on to day four, this is where uh, we're at now. This is the beginning part of the day. I, I put my Dietra down now. A lot of times I usually like to get that Dietra in on day three, but there just wasn't enough time with everything that I was doing there. Um, but you, you can basically put this Dietra mat down at any process. It doesn't really matter when you do it. I just happened to do it here in the morning. Um, you know, so because I want, I was, my hope was day four, I was actually going to get into the tiling of the floor, but just didn't, that didn't work out, didn't have enough time. Um, but, uh, you know, in all intents and purposes, you might want to wait to do the Dietra till later in the day. Um, just walking over it, it's not a big deal. What I did was after I put the Dietra down, I did put cardboard uh, over everything so that I'm not messing up all of the curdy band that I just put down. So, you know, there's no problem with walking on fresh Dietra. You just want to protect, you know, you don't want to be scuffing up the, the, the waterproofing membrane that you put down. So I go into a lot of detail. This is what we went over yesterday, obviously, if you were here watching yesterday. Uh, biggest thing about Schluter products is making sure that that thin set is very loose. So this is the proper way you go about sealing against the tub, really important area. And I also like to go a little overboard and, and do all the seams around the corner of the room. I think it makes a lot of sense to just waterproof that entire room and it doesn't really cost you anymore because you already have the materials that you bought to do the rest of the bathroom. So this is what I'm talking about. Like when you have, when you have this teacher down, if you're immediately walking on this curdy band, you can kind of scuff it up and it won't be flat. So my suggestion is just put some cardboard down over top of this if you're going to be working for the rest of the day. Now, obviously, I did this at like 8.30 in the morning, so I didn't want to damage all of this. I wanted to um, start working on the towel work on the back 
layer. So this is going to be our end goal. This is what we're looking forward to. This is the, the tiling, uh, the, the finished product, essentially. So that's what our, our, my, our primary goal is of this. And uh, I'm going to help you get there. So um, RJ, love watching your content. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, man. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I'm really excited to get this new channel moving forward here. So thanks for joining me. Um, Viganesh San, how do you deal with unplumbed walls in one section after the installation? So unplumbed walls, yeah, I mean, you know, my suggestion is if it's if it's less than a quarter inch out, I really wouldn't go too crazy on adjusting that. But really, there's only three different methods of doing that. One would be um, to actually just take an electric planer and plane down uh, one half of the stud. That can be kind of difficult in some ways, especially when you're getting up to the ceiling. If you do that method, you usually have to take a chisel or something to, to finish it off because you can't get the, uh, the the electric planer all the way up to the ceiling or the floor for that matter, about the same difference. Uh, the second thing would be, and probably the easiest, would be to sister a stud to the side of the stud and bring it out to plumb. Yeah, there's no problem doing that. And then again, then the, the, the last alternative is actually shimming it. Um, but if it's unplumb, you know, depending on how bad it is, it, that's kind of a tough shim to make because you're basically going from nothing to whatever three eighths of an inch whatever you have but i would probably go with sistering the studs i think that's the easiest way to go but again if it's quarter inch out i really wouldn't go crazy trying to um, fight yourself on that because that most of the time everything that you do you can overcome a quarter inch pretty easily even the shower doors most of them have variances with that amount but again i mean it's it's your project you have to uh, be as precise as you want to be, but that's usually my threshold on that. Um, but I'll probably put out a video here at some point going over those three methods. I do have some of that in the course, um, highlighting that, but I didn't, I didn't really have a major unlevel, unplumb situation. So as I get into those situations, I'll, I'll definitely bring them out onto this channel. So, all right, so let's get into the course. Let's get into our topic tonight. Um, again, if you're in the chat, please give me a like on this video. It really helps out the algorithm. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. And be sure to check out my playlist. So when you go to my channel, uh, go to Bathroom Remodeling Online Course. And then these will be all the other courses. So I'm basically, you know, you don't even have to buy the course. You can actually just watch everything here on YouTube if you wanted but I think you'll find that there's a lot of value in the course that will be helpful. Not only would you have access to me, but you would have, um, there's a lot of links in here that you'll see that are really helpful. And uh, once I get this built out, like I'm still on day four here, obviously, uh, there's seven days of this bathroom remodel. And uh, I'm hoping to have this done by the end of the month. But I'm going to have some checklists involved with this that will help you uh, get organized. This is all about planning ahead. Um, I think that's really one of the most important things. Every bathroom job that I do, as soon as I take a look at it and I win the job and I'm going to do it, it just circles through my mind. And I'm almost doing this selfishly in some fashion because if I can get um, things down to an organized checklist, I can use myself. If I, if I, Basically, if I'm going to use it myself, then I think you're going to find a lot of value with it because um, you know that's primarily all I do is bathroom remodeling. So um, anything to make it easier and not have to constantly be thinking about it it's helpful but right now i have two different courses i have one on custom glass enclosures because i know custom glass enclosures are a real pain point if you're doing a custom bathroom um, I, this is where people run out of money they basically uh, you know spent a lot of money on their showers and all the different fixtures and then they get it into the glass and it's like another three thousand dollars for a glass enclosure so i feel if you if you're good at tile work um, you should be able to be able to order your own glass and, and install your own glass. And I go over a lot of tips from, you know, my experience of installing them. And I have also have a lot of template. I have templates in there that you can easily print out and, and mark your measurements because it's really important to get communication with your glass enclosure or your glass company. Cause you're going to have to go to a la local glass shop to order tempered glass. And, uh, you know, if you're organized and you bring your stuff there in confidence, they won't have any problems selling it to you. They're not going to try to make you feel like you're not going to be able to do it yourself. So I have a lot of great tips in there. If you're, if you're a young contractor, this is a way to make a, 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 for sure an extra thousand dollars on your job. 
Um, because that's, you know, I would say that's probably typically what most glass companies charge between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars just to install the actual glass. So Dominic, good to see you. Thank you. Um, all right. So tub and shower course, I just kind of went through the, the, the beginning reference of it, but it is a completely inclusive course or it will be by the time the end of this month from start to finish seven days. I have it outlined basically in a seven day fashion. And as you can see, um, where we basically go over every part of it. So what I'm hoping is since I'm selling this for a really low price at $25 right now, because I don't have the course finished, I'm really looking for feedback and I really want to make this the best course that I can. So if I get common questions all the time about things, just like, uh, Vinesh just was asking me about, uh, the, the planning of the studs or how do you make an unplumbed wall? I'll add a video onto that. That's definitely something I would definitely add into this just to make things easier on it. And I know that the first two days is where all the problems are going to lie. The rest of the job, um, you know, it's just going to, it's just going to take patience to do everything. But my hope is that this tile installation process is going to be fun because you're going to be set up with the right materials and the right guidance to go about doing it. So let's get right into it. So as you can see how this course is outlined, it's all basically referenced by the day. And then I just have the highlighted points of each section. This is really important to keep your focus on what you're doing. Don't get wrapped up into electrical too much on the first two days. You want to make sure you get those core components in. Get that tub in, get that tub and shower faucet in, and then you can mess around with the, the electrical a little bit later. You don't have to solve all of the issues or run out the Home Depot to finish. Um, you know, I mean, obviously there's some key components. You need to get the tub in so that you can get the waterproofing in so then you can start tiling. Um, tiling is going to take is a process. It's going to take a couple of days to complete the tub surround, and that's what draws out the project. So you don't want to get um, wrapped into trying to figure out where all your electrical goes to to a certain extent. I mean, if it's a real bad a bad mess, you want to make <laughs> make sure it's right. But you don't have to hang all your drywall up. You can figure out that electrical a little bit later. You don't have to be messing around with it. And I'm, I guess I'm saying that to myself because I, I tend to do that. I tend to um, obsess about, you know, how this is working, where it's going, what am I, you know. So I always have to remind myself, nope, focus, get back to this, get the tub in, and then we'll move on to the next part. Um, all right, so towel setting. So we did these three yesterday. Uh, and we had a lot of a, a big topic on thin set and tile layout. Uh, that's really important to go over um, because that's really the, the biggest process that makes this easier for installing. So we're going to get into setting the tile on the back wall. Um, so Damien, I'll, I'll get back to you shortly here on here, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into the chat later. I don't want to, um, I want to keep this kind of flowing here. So, but let's get into this tile setting portion of this, and uh, you know, if you want to, if you have any questions about this particular pr part of this, I will pause the video and we'll go over it. Okay, so you can see that this is it's a fairly thick consistency. So using the flat side of the trowel, I would recommend just burn it into the substrate. So that's basically, you know, that's a big part of the process is making sure that the thin set is well bonded to any substrate, whether it's a floor, whether it's a wall. So always burn that thin set in with the flat side of the trowel, make sure that it's well bonded into the substrate. And that also allows you to get better directional troweling. So when you're troweling with the trowel, you're going to get a better coverage if you back trowel that wall surface. Um, so it, that's just a really important thing because you want to make sure it's really well bonded to the wall. Now, this is go board, so this is a waterproof material. Typically, if I was doing something like hardy backer or cement board, which I really don't even use anymore, and I really kind of despise hardy backer, honestly, because it's such a – it absorbs so much – of the thin set moisture in anything for that matter. And it's just a real problematic type of board. I'm not really sure why they came out with it, but um, 
if you're doing hardy back or something like that, definitely put a liquid waterproofing over it. You like thin set will be zapped immediately. So if you're doing hardy backer board, you want to kind of dampen the surface before you start tiling. Um, but in a tub surround, it should be waterproof. So going over a waterproof uh, membrane or uh, waterproof board like this, you don't really have to dampen down the surface. You don't want to, you can just use the backside of the trowel and, and burn that in. <laughs> We're going to be using a quarter inch by quarter inch trowel. Most of the time I set my tile with the same thickness of uh, trowel on the smaller tiles, but this isn't always the, the best way to, to know whether you need it. I'll show you here in a minute. We'll, we'll spread this thin set first. So directional troweling, I always, you know, okay, so uh, one way to, it's a very minute, um topic here but if six by six is obviously they're the same size all the way around um but if you did like 12 by 24s or something you always want to trowel your ridges on the short side of the tile and that's really just for efficiency of the air to escape basically the reason you have those ridges is so that when you set the tile the air escapes and the, and the ridges collapse and now it'll give you the coverage on back of the tile so go on the short side of the tile if you can uh, a lot of times that's the direction I go is going straight up the wall like that, but pay attention to the actual tile that you're installing and these smaller tiles, it, it almost doesn't even matter really. So these six by sixes, I would always back water a little bit too, but just to start this out to make sure you have the right trial size is just stick a piece on here and see what kind of coverage you're going to get. So that's pretty good coverage. You want to have 95%. When you see this all suctioning off like that, that means you have really good coverage. I have a little bald spot here, but basically as long as 95% of this entire area is covered in thin set, that's what you want it to look like. So this was a little bit of a repeat of yesterday, but I, th I think this concept's really important. And if you're not getting the coverage okay, that so you I'm want, start right at the center then go here. up with a, the higher and then, trial size. I like using these horseshoe shims. These are much nicer than those rubber spacers. This makes it really easy. To You'll find that to be much easier than those rubber spacers. At the tub layer. So make sure that you uh, put something there. Because the main reason for that is that not only expansion and contraction, but it's nicer to have something that you can actually fill in with thin, uh, silicone. So when you have a gap here, it allows that silicone to go into that groove and then it really holds on. So your silicone will last a lot longer if you have a gap to, towards the tub. And that's one sad part about all tub surround installations. Um, you know, unfortunately the, the, the weak point, the maintenance issue is always the caulking. Um, there hasn't been a single bathtub I've ever installed where the caulking has lasted more than five years. It always ends up um, becoming grimy in some way, even, you know, I mean, you want to use hundred percent silicone. I would stay away from the acrylic matching caulks. I don't really feel that they last a very long time. They don't have a really good elasticity to it. In my experience, I just have not had much great experience with the acrylic caulks. They're easier to kind of like caulk, but they're just, they don't have the, the same elasticity as, as, as um, silicone. But unfortunately a tub surround you're always going to have, or a tub, you're always going to have a caulk joint to the tub because especially with these acrylic tubs, they definitely, when you're walking in there or filling up with water, they're expanding and traction. And, um, I'll show you later on. Well, not now, but when we get further into the course, you want to fill up that tub with water and in caulk because the weight of that tub kind of, it does kind of flex it down a little bit and you want to have that space being the maximum distance that it is so that you're not putting stress on the, the silicone these are really minute issues here but you are going to get a longer lasting grout or caulk joint if you keep space there and that you you know kind of follow my guidance on that so it's a small detail but it is important the horseshoe shims really make it easy to do all of the spacing that you need so i highly recommend you just buy a, a hundred pack of those and you can reuse them and uh, just so much easier than those rubber spacers but as you can see here, and we went over this towel process yesterday, um, you know, if so watch the other live stream, I go into more detail on it. 
but I really like using a laser for my first row and then just basically referencing that for that first row and making sure that I have um, an even joint all the way around the bottom of that tub. And that's again why you want to be using a, um, you don't want to be starting out with a full towel at that tub surround. You want to start with something less so you can scribe cut. And if your tub isn't 100% level or uneven in some way, you have the ability to adjust that and make sure that that joint looks good. And I typically, I mean, you could put spacers in between here. I typically just eye up my vertical joints. I don't see any reason to go through putting all of the uh, horseshoe shims on the vertical joints. So I'm taking a little bit of time on the beginning of this because I just think it's important to watch. And then, you know, I better turn off this music. Sorry, guys. I'm going to get demonetized immediately for that. I already did on the last one. So I do have some music in here, but I'm not going to play it on this part because I don't want it to uh, YouTube to give me a copyright claim. While I'm here right now, Damien, so you have a Schluter waterproofing membrane on your shower and you notice some bumps. That is one issue with Schluter. Yeah, um, you know, if you're not getting things flat enough, there's always buildup. Even if you are a pro, um, you're always going to have buildup. And that's one of the sad things about Schluter, one of the annoying things about it, about it I guess I should say, is that you're going to have buildup from the membranes going over membranes. Um, you're just going to have to be able to overcome that with your tiling process. So I don't know what kind of towel you plan on using. If you're using larger towel, it's really no big deal at all. But if you're using something like this, six by sixes, it can be a little bit frustrating. And so you can grind down the back of the tile to overcome it or use a uh, you know more thin set behind that tile to, to overcome it. But the lumps, I mean, it depends on how bad it is. Um, but, you know, it sounds to me that you might have not used the right size trowel. Uh, you, that's one important thing you need to do with the Schluter products is using the right size trowel. So eighth by eighth for the membranes. And then Ditra is a, a 3 16 inch notch trowel. Um, and then, you know, the most important thing about any Schluter system is making sure that that thin set is wet enough. So making sure it's the wettest allowable amount for that manufacturer's specs. When, when I use I primarily just use Schluter All Set, which is their own product. And I think they have a superior bond with their membranes. Um, but I always do it at the wettest ratio. So it's really, really fluid. You would not want to set tile with the, 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 thin, the thin layer of um, thin set that you'd be using. But, uh, yeah, it, it's hard to say whether you'd have an issue or not. It doesn't sound like you probably do. Um, you're just going to have to overcome it when, with your tiling process. Um, and one more question with Kevin. Uh, PEX A, crimp on, or PEX B? PEX B, no doubt, I, I, is probably a better system to go to. I'm actually considering moving into that world because the tools have actually finally started coming down in price. I kind of stated, well... I'm still kind of frustrated with it. I, I don't. I don't want to transform everything I have, so I have a lot of PEX A fittings, and you can't use PEX A fittings with PEX B. So they're totally two different systems, and um, it's just hard for me to transfer because I have so many of the other fittings. And uh, and I think for a DIYer or somebody who is new in the contracting, um, well, you should probably decide which way you're going to go. But maybe PEX B is really where the future is going to be. Um, it, they do seem to have a lot of things going behind them and a lot of plumbers are behind it and it seems a lot of ways a, a good system, but I've never had an issue with PEX A with the crimps. Uh, you know, like I said, I've been doing nothing but bathrooms for 14 years. I don't know when PEX A came out, uh, precisely, but I, I just never had an issue. So I'm, I'm, I'm all, I feel confident with it. I find it to be easy. The tools are cheap. You know, you can get a crimper for 50 bucks, the expanding tool for PEX B, it's pretty expensive, so I don't really see myself getting into it until things are really reasonably priced. So I do have a little bit of music on this video when you're in the course, but on YouTube here, I don't want to do that. But So yeah, using all those spacers. I don't really use the spacers for the... Uh, vertical joints, I just kind of eye them up. But this is a time that you really need to spend some time making sure that that tile is meeting that laser. Don't 
you know, make those adjustments now. Spend the time on that first row because everything else is going to be much, much easier after then. So I basically just back butter each one, place them, wipe it up, clean it a little bit. One of my favorite tools is the uh, linoleum knife. It's just like a little scraper tool. Um, but you can see the pattern just kind of repeats itself. But getting that first row set is, you know, really the most important aspect of this. The rest of it becomes kind of a breeze. And then that's one of my favorite towel cutters, uh, the Montelit uh, Mini Puma. These are great for this little type of job. Um, and a lot of times you really don't need a wet saw. Uh, it's nice to have a wet saw, but not absolutely necessary. Biggest thing here too is that you don't want that thin set that you spread on the wall sitting there too long. I would say if you if you waited 10 minutes, you want to scrape it off and reapply new thin set. You don't want it to skin over because if it skins over, then you're not getting a good bond to the tile. Um, but if you use this Ardex product, um, I really can't say enough about Ardex products. I really love their thin set. It lasts a long time. And if you haven't done a whole lot of tile work, it's going to give you the pot life that you need. Um, cause there's a lot of thin sets out there, especially the big box stores, they'll be hardened in a bucket in an hour. And, uh, most likely if you haven't been doing a lot of tile, it's going to take you much, much longer to put everything together. Now this is, this is all, you know, this whole tiling process becomes fun because, uh, you kind of set everything up to be easy. So I'll show you here once we get out of my way here. So you can see right here, I have my niche lined up with this grout joint right here. Makes it really nice and easy because then I just put my second tile, I get a, my, put my shelf, so I got a 12 inch space right there. Go two more tiles right at that grout joint, put another shelf, makes it really easy. So if you plan ahead and make these niches where they work best, it makes the whole tiling process so much easier. Um, so that's just a, you know, in the previous videos, we really went into depth on that. Um, but again, like to, it's just the planning ahead makes everything a lot more fun and easy. Sorry, I don't can't put this out there or the volume that I have there, but the music is going to get me a copyright claim. So six by sixes are really easy. I know probably a lot of you are not using this, but you know, this was a fairly inexpensive. Yeah, so I could get the volume back up here. Worked out really well. When we lined these joints up with the bottom of the niche, we were able to basically right at the end of a towel layer, put a shelf. So we're just gonna be using these little small pieces of quartz for that. So, but what you want to do is notch this piece over top of our niche of, of our shelf. So we have five and a half. Let's cut a five and a half inch piece. Okay, so we're just gonna notch this. I'd say the easiest way to do this is just put a piece of. So basically just tracing it onto that six by six. Okay. And then just using a grinder. Like I said, having a good grinder and a decent blade really helps out a lot. Uh, my favorite blade is the ST Montelit STL blade. Um, I have links in the description for that as well. Um, Okay, so you want to have a little bit of wiggle room with this shelf because you want to be able to shim it and angle it down. Plus, you're going to be putting a caulk joint against that as well. So that's going to work for this pretty well. Interesting, Dominic. I guess I'll have to look into that. I didn't realize you can use the crimp rings on 
Pex B. Okay, then I just wipe this thin set off so that you can place that shelf in when you're ready to do the niche. And I'll probably double check the placement. So that should work. Better shut that off. There we go. It's kind of the same process. Um, So as you can see there, I have just a piece of plywood on top of that tub. It kind of makes a little of a, an area for, for doing this. It makes it a little bit nicer there. So that little linoleum knife is probably my main, my main tool for scraping out all those joints. And, uh, yeah, so where I usually stop for the day, like this is this is you know obviously the the first day of actually tiling the walls, but I usually stop right at that border joint that we were planning to have because I like to get that set up, and we'll, we'll be showing that a little bit later here about setting up your mosaic. So we're gonna be stopping here for today while we let that mosaic set up. So just make sure you scrape out all this thin set and just clean it up. Anytime you stop anywhere at any point, you know, you want to make sure you off that thin set. It's kind of obvious stuff, but Okay. All right, so we're going to be using some bull nose and uh, just like the waterproofing, I always recommend bringing at least the bull nose at the very least having the bull nose coming down alongside the tub. Because again, this is still the same area where there's always issues um with water going down the side edge of the tub and then deteriorating that drywall so having the tile going directly to the edge is uh or down along the side of the tub is going to make sure that it lasts a lot longer so let's go ahead and lay this out and see how this turns out basically a four and three quarter inch piece so that works out pretty well because now it'll leave us an inch and three quarters. So what I would do is offset the corner rather than just having another small piece mirroring each other. I would recommend doing that fuller, that four and three quarter inch piece off of this so it looks like the tile is bending in the corner. So all we want to do is make sure that we end up with the smaller piece in the corner so that this bends through. So Basically, instead of going with a full tile, we're going to start out with a half tile. So yeah, so that's really the same process and you'll see, I mean, I'm doing the sides of this tub surround after the back wall. Main reason was that was to hide that grout joint. It's always nicer to have that back wall done first. So then the tiles on the side kind of go up against and it kind of hides your visual view of the main part of the bathroom. Now the corners all have to be caulked, 100% silicone. Um, but this process is pretty much the same as the back. Always, you know, as you can see right here, let me pause that. So you can see this little curvature piece of tile. So if you started out with a full piece of tile on this first row, you wouldn't be able to do that. You would have some kind of ugly little um, corner piece here. So this is just a small detail, but this is what separates, you know, being, having a professional looking job and somebody who, um, you know, just didn't know any better, I guess you could say. So this is, and you wouldn't even, you know, there's a lot of people that would try the, for the full towel on the back wall. And then once they got to here, they're like, Oh, okay. Now what am I going to do with that? That's why you want to start with a lower, um, you know, take a couple inches off that first tile so you can create that curvature right there.
Pay attention to your thin set though. I'm starting to get a little bit thick here um, because that's getting towards the end of the life of the thin set. Um, but you just, you know, you don't want to spread too much thin set out on the wall uh, if you can't get all that tile set within a timely manner. Usually 10 minutes is about all you can handle. But this thin set is starting to get a little bit thick on me. And uh, I, pro I probably end up having to, to mix a little bit more here shortly. But, but simple process, you know, I have that laser there, but it's nice to also reference a level as well. Um, but this is where having a flat wall really makes a big difference with setting tile too. Um, you know, if if you have uneven walls or if you're putting backer board over something that has a little bit more than a quarter inch dip, it really makes this process kind of frustrating. So it'll make it a lot easier for you if you have a nice flat wall. Now, as you can see, my curdy band sticking outside of my water, uh, out of my tile area, and then I'll be just running some mud down there afterwards. Okay, with this thin set, even a couple hours later, you can start taking some of these out and cleaning up the tile. Definitely going to make it easier on you if you can do it even in the same day. So just make sure it's hard. This is probably about three, three hours later that we're taking these out. But uh, when the thin set's soft, it certainly makes it a lot easier to clean up the tile. Yeah, especially a if you're kind of a messy pad. tiler like I am. <laughs> and just scrub off all yeah, the tile. Scrubby pads, definitely a must. Um, you know, and if you're doing this at home, you know, I, in the evening, I would take all these out, do the scrubbing then. It's gonna, you'll be a lot less, less work. In my next video, I have something on here that will help you if, if you went way much longer than you should have. I, I always recommend cleaning this tile within 24 hours like the next morning definitely cleaning everything because the modified thin set will definitely get really really difficult to, to remove and uh, if you have a problem like that this is where this will help out a lot so let me show you this here this is a uh, sulfamic acid crystals that you can add the water this will soften up the uh, the thin set if you if and this is primarily like if you waited to like the following weekend. If if you're a weekend warrior and you're trying to do a bathroom remodel, you know, and, and you didn't get back to it till the following week, this is how you're gonna solve that issue. Oh. All right. Well, you can just plant down. So. Cool. Okay, so quick tip for removing your thin set. If you took a couple days before you actually scraped out your joints. The thin set gets really tough, and, and the best way to go about uh, fixing that is using some sulfamic acid with a little bit of water. Put it on a spray bottle and just spray the joint. And wear a respirator. Now you want to be careful using. what you use this on. You don't want to put this on natural stone or marble. It could take the polish off of it or possibly do something to the stone. But most ceramic porcelains, this is a great way to soften up the thin set and be able to easily scrape everything out. Just let it apply it, apply it, let it sit for five minutes, and it'll be like uh, a very loose, easy um, way to remove that thin set. So again, just be careful about what you're putting that on. Natural stone might, you know, you might want to test an area before you even do that. Um, but yeah, I said five minutes. It might actually take 10 minutes to actually soften it up. But the other thing you want to do too is make sure that you really scrub it with clean water afterwards um, because you don't want this stuff in the joints before you, grout because the grout would most likely um, deteriorate from the sulfamic acid so uh, really you want to have everything dry before you start grouting so if you're doing this next morning and your intention is to grout right afterwards I'd, I'd definitely get a fan in there dry everything up um, you know scrub it down with water with a sponge before before grouting you, you don't want this stuff um, jeopardizing your grout joint but then in each each one of my um, Parts, parts of my courses here, let me just move this over here. So looking at the full course description here, you'll see that I have a whole bunch of different links, helpful links to be able to go through things. I, I really did highlight this, go back to my other course or my other part of the course to go over thin set and tile layout. But mostly right here, I just have a lot of reminders of how to go about things. Just some important notes to go through because I know you're not going to want to watch another 15 minute video before tiling and i'm hoping that you're watching this stuff way before you actually get started so you can have some of this for reference 
Um, but you know, again, I have my link to my favorite uh, thin set. This is Artex X5. I think it's a reasonably priced thin set, 33 bucks. You can get it at the towel shop if you have one near you. Um, but I really, I can't say enough about it. Uh, it's something that I found 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago. And ever since I started using their products, I just never went back. It's been really, um, it made, made it a lot easier to do a lot of my towel work. But you always measure your water before you're mixing. I just kind of go over mixing instructions. That's really important. You don't want to be eyeing things up that no longer exist today. Um, and then I just go over some major parts of, you know, the, what we kind of went over, but the thin set coverage, um, back buttering your tiles. Now, if you had subway tiles, that's probably not really necessary. And some people might say it's not even necessary to do that on six by sixes. But just check your coverage. P put that towel on the wall see what it looks like if it looks like this then you don't you don't have to back butter because it's a waste of time for you because that, that's pretty good coverage there um i go over the tools just to kind of help you out using a laser is a really important part of all of bathroom remodeling i think that if you bought a laser you'll definitely get the use out of it even hanging your accessories makes it a lot easier i go over um you know just some of the other things i have in this video this is my favorite um diamond blade the stl blade uh and then if you want to try to reduce hot dust in the home and you're a contractor i do definitely recommend getting one of these shrouds for your grinder um now this is really tough to make really accurate cuts with this is more for like scribe cutting or um just cutting pieces that need a little bit more it is tough with the guard to really see exactly what you're cutting but you know i use the combination of the both i have one of these and then i have one of these for i, I primarily use this one a lot of the times for um shower floor tile because i don't want to use my i don't want to take the mosaic tile and, and put it through a wet saw and then have the backing of the uh the backing of my mosaic towel kind of falling apart so i like to dry cut everything and this is a great way to do it so i, I really use this fine shrouding grinder for most of my mosaics for shower floors um, and in floor tile in general, but it's it's tough to get accurate on a, on a lot of things. So, you know, it's not something that fine tuning, you wanna use something like this for the fine tuning. Um, yeah, so then I go through my, you know, I have some links to the, the, the Montelit Master Puma. Um, not all of them are on Amazon. Um, but some, a lot of the stuff I do have on here is just for reference. But uh, if you're a contractor, I know that's a really high price for somebody who might be just doing just one bathroom. But I think uh, if you're a contractor doing this stuff, you'll you'll definitely won't regret getting that. Um, then my favorite tool is linoleum knife. It's a very simple tool, but it's just, you know, I love it for tiling. You know, I've had to buy one since then, but, um, you know, definitely worth grabbing helps out with the towel i show you my my wet saw that i like to use again you don't always need a wet saw you can do most of this stuff with just a good grinder and a good manual cutter um, scrubby pads are important um, and then i just kind of go over the reference of the tile layout just to give you a, uh, a general overview of what you want to pay attention to do it setting that back wall first making sure you cut that first row down so that you can create the nice curvature around the tub um, and starting from center, most of the time works, depends on the set, the towel setup that you're using. And then I go over, you know, using these, uh, making sure that you have a gap between the tub. And then when you finish it off at any part of the day, you want to make sure you clean off that thin set. And then I have a link to this sulfamic acid. If you possibly think you might need it. Um, you know, I'd probably, you know, if you're doing towel work, this is nice to also just clean up all your tools. You can put, uh, put a little bit of this in a five gallon bucket and throw your tools in there. And that makes it nice and it cleans off all that thin set. And I just have a whole bunch of other links below this that should be able to help you out as well. And then again, if you in the course you have a question, leave a comment here, you can add a picture and I can try to help you out the best that I can. Um, so I think there's a lot of value in these courses that you'll definitely get out of. And I'm not, you know, like I said, I'm not really charging a whole lot for it. And excuse me if uh, everyone in the chat right now <laughs> has already bought and then they already know everything about it. So moving on to the next step. So that's one of, one of the great things about this course too, is you can just go step by step and move on to the next project, get your mind straight on what you want to do next. So usually once I uh, tile that section, that probably took me past lunchtime, I'm sure. 
I'd have to really go back and remember exactly what I did that day. Um, most likely I, the towel setting did go all the way up till like two o'clock and then I move on to drywall finishing. So this is the second coat. This is going to be, you know, there's some good tips in here that I hope that will help you out. Um, a lot of this drywall finishing is just, uh, it's just about having patience and to not play around with it too much, you know, get it on there. You always have the ability to sand it later and, and add another coat. But this is just a, my process that I've found to be one of the easiest ways to go about it. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping to get some value out of it as well. Second coat. So again, you're just, again, just putting a half trial of mud on. And I always do the ceiling for my second coat first. It just seems to be now, a little bit. You know, I just did that tub surround. So you see all these air bubbles in here right here. If I would have mixed that m bucket of mud, it would have been a little bit creamier. And I wouldn't have had all of these little spots like this. So this is partly from being in a rush. So if you start seeing when you're spreading your mud like that and you see that, just take your mixer mix that mud up a little bit and you can even add like a little bit of water and that'll kind of uh, make it creamier too easier but you just coat this joint and then just feather it's it really up. tough to explain the actual feeling of this but Here's really it's two passes it's putting it's about all you want to do it's kind of putting pressure any more than that. with my trowel just taking too much off against the wall in the corner but i'm not pressing i'm not pressing up into the corner i'm kind of pressing against the corner and then i have a good um you know basically hard feel where that feathered edge is um you know, I might be able to get better at explaining it at some point, but it's really difficult to explain that motion. It looks easy, but then, you know, when you actually put it into practice, it's a little bit, a little bit more difficult. And it's just kind of like having a light touch in that corner um, because that's all you're really doing. You're, you're only putting a small layer of mud over your tape. You don't need a lot. You just don't, you just don't want to see the tape. If you see tape, then you, um, or I shouldn't say see it, if, if you can feel it, then it, when you paint it, it'll bubble up and cause problems. So um, you definitely want to coat it. There's a lot of professional drywallers that would probably say that's too much mud, um, but with a six inch knife, that's probably the way it'll end up being. And again, you can just sand this down and, and if you needed to feather out this joint a little bit more, that's what the third coat is for because the, the third coat, is basically coating the other sides of the corner so you have the ability to go over all these spots if you need to. So that's what I mean. If you at least get this the second coat, this will give you enough time. To... I'm not sure if I finished my point on that one, but. You want to put that second coat on so that, you know, the next morning. Because now, when I was doing this bathroom, it was like 100 degrees in July. So if you don't get your second coat of mud on on that fourth day, um, you know, because really I wasn't even going to be sanding it till later in the day, the following day. Um, but this could still be wet because of the humidity. So pay attention to, you know, the humidity level in your home. But I, I really do find it important to have that second coat done the following day so that you have enough time to address the walls and get things painted. Because you don't want to put your vanity in. You don't want to be hanging mirrors. You don't want to be doing anything until you have the room painted. So this is a really kind of a time-sensitive thing. If you're trying to do this in seven days, you need to get that second coat on. But Troy, as far as your question about X5 being on the creamy side, yes, definitely more creamy. Uh, the, the X77 which is the next premium grade of thin set that is a lot more fluffy it's it has a more sticky fluffy consistency but yeah the x5 is definitely creamy um if you're using smaller batches of the x5 they all i think it says i have to look at it again i think it said two parts powder one part water or it could be three I, i'd have to look at that again but the smaller quantities are going to be a lot more creamy and it's not going to have a real thick consistency but typically on our x5 i always use six and a half quarts 
per bag. That's that's right in the middle of their ratio. Um, but if you small do smaller batches, it ends up being a lot looser of a mix. Um, I would say, you know, most of the time you can be uh, a little too loose and be okay. It's just when you get too thick and you don't get the bonded, you know, the bondage to the tile, that's where all the problems lie. So you're always a little bit better off to be a little bit too wet than too, um, too dry. And then if you streak like this on the bottom wall, don't worry about that. The next morning you just scrape that off. So don't even try to touch that corner. Just leave it alone. You I'll have to know when to, to walk away. Take care too, of tomorrow. You because know. you could drive yourself nuts, keep going over it. But if you have a little bit of, you know, extra mud coming down here off the bottom, don't worry about it. You can scrape that off. Use your sanding pad to go over it. It's not a big deal. And I understand this, you know, this does look a little bit easier than what it is in real life. But, um... It's sure heck beats taking wallpaper off. Because <laughs> most of the time when you take wallpaper off, it's just going to, uh, you're going to have to mud the whole wall anyways. Hey, architectural, hey, Alex, architectural sheet metal. Yeah, so you're Good basically to see you, man. Second coach for joining. Doing one side of the corner and in the main seams. So you're not, you're not trying to get both coated at the same time. They do make corner trowels, but I've never had any success with that. You always have too much mud using them. That's why it's just, it's easier to take three coats. Honestly, and it's almost four coats really because the amount of touch ups that you end up having, it's almost like another coat. So. Oh, right, Kevin, then, South Carolina, you're right. Pex B is the crimp one. For the main scene. Pex A is the expansion. I always get that confused for some stupid reason. I use a, a 10 inch knife and a 12 inch knife. So I apply. So this was actually, I was I was wrong on that. I thought that that was a 12 inch. This is actually a 10 inch and that's a 14 inch. So I do use a 14 inch most of the time. And that's why I have in there 12 or 14. So a lot of guys, so I, I put some of this stuff out on social media. I always love uh, the comments. <laughs> To a certain extent, I get a lot of, you know, I don't know. TikTok is definitely an aggressive place, but there's a lot of guys that give you a lot of great tips. So there's a lot of guys that are just using a six inch knife like I'm using there, but then they're they're applying eight inch and then they're wiping it off with a 12 inch. So I do think having something that is like four inches wider than the knife that you applied on. Now, this is for the straight seams I'm talking about. So the straight seams, um, that's where you use the bigger knives to cover over it. So what I've been hearing, and I'm going to try it on my next job to see how much better it actually is. But this is what I've been used, doing for the last eight or nine years is basically using a 10 inch knife. I mean, that, that, that old blade right there, that thing's probably 15 years old and same with the other one. That, it's hard to get rid of your old, um, mudding tools because they're, they're so worn in nicely that, uh, it, it's hard to get away from them. But, you know, you could go with an eight inch knife and then remove it with a 12 but i do think a four inch difference makes a big it helps out a lot um and it's just basically you know you're able to get a, a lot of pressure on that joint and take all the excess off so you'll even see when i put this on here that i definitely have 12 10 a pretty thick layer of mud. The 12 all right and then just cut the corners that allows you to spread it more evenly <laughs> So again, you see there's bubbles in that mud. If I would have mixed it, I probably wouldn't have as any, many bubbles into it. But, you know, I'm always in a rush. So you just apply the mud with the 10 inch. You're almost like, you're almost putting too much mud on there. And then with your 12 inch, you basically just apply quite a bit of pressure just smooth it out. Don't worry about the bubbles. The third coat is to take care of that. And just leave it alone. You can sand some of that up and then some of the bubbles that come out. Yeah, you can even, I even have play with some tomorrow. blemishes here. My third coat, I, I went over some of those areas. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you're better off to get that second coat done and move yeah, on with the day. Wipe out the edge of your bucket. 
because that'll keep that crusties from forming in there. Okay, so just apply it with a 10 inch. Yeah, that's that mud should have definitely been uh, mixed up. You can see how many bubbles are in it. I don't know. And scrape it off. I can see why I got a lot of slack on the social media, but with the hey. Yep. There's a little line in there. It just all turns out well though. You could try to play around with it. I mean, you can do the whole joint over again. If you got something in there, it's not the end of the world. But the more you play with it, the less likely you're going to get a good result. And then that little thing, that can be sanded off real easily. And then I just take my 10 inch knife for these holes and just put a, a thicker bead on it. And this is the plus three mud. Um, it's like an easy sand, so all this stuff is really easy to sand. So if you have any little bit of stuff on, it's not a real big deal. Again, this is like six and a half sheets of drywall, so most of your bathrooms are not really that um, that much, and the expense of it's not that much. So don't be afraid to take your walls down because it's going to make the whole process a lot easier if you do. Okay, so that's the second coat. Uh, and then again, I, every time that I, uh, each one of my lessons, I just have some references of things to go over and, and be sure of because I know that time is money or time is um, valuable. So I just kind of go over this a quick reference. You can just look at this real briefly on your phone before you get started. But I have um, a bunch of um, other links. This is that plus three mod. This is what I primarily use. I think it's um, some pretty nice, easy stuff to work with. It's a light joint compound. So um, we'll move on to the floor tile floor layout. Now, it would have been ultimately nice to actually set this floor today on day four, but, you know, there's a lot of things going on here. So you don't always get everything done, but if you, at least if you have the good bulk of your decision making the day before, you can even think on it on the way home and then the next day implement everything. But I like to dry fit most of my flooring tile, especially in these smaller bathrooms. But I give you a lot of um, simple tips to go over when you're installing the, the tile or, or figuring out your layout for that matter. Okay, so floor tile, floor layout. Um, typically in a smaller bathroom like this, you always just kind of want to reference the tub. So however you install the tub, make that your square edge uh, because you don't want to really scribe cut anything uneven against the tub so don't even worry about what your walls are just be concerned with the tub and everything off of that is going to be referencing what's square um, a lot of these small bathrooms i mean they could be tremendously out of square um, yeah so don't sweat it don't don't be overly um thoughtful about your tile layout i, I see way too many people messing around with really like mauling over, you know, where's my, I mean, find your center lines. Um, but really just kind of think about what am, what am I mostly going to see? You're going to have a vanity in the corner. You're going to have a toilet sitting next to the tub. You know, you're not going to really see uh, the reference of anything on that side of the room. So don't overcomplicate things. Just move on to the next step and really I always reference my squareness off of that tub. If my tub is unsquare, you know, that that's, you know, I don't know what to say about that. That's just the way it is. Um, you know, but if you have your tile on, you know, even if you went with two by two tile, say the 12 by 24s are really easy. Like you can, you can be uh, an inch off from the other side of the room and it's hard to tell, but where you really notice imperfections is in the smaller tiles so if you did like hexagonal tiles say if you did the two by two hexagonal tiles you want to reference that tub because if you're if you end up cutting from one side to the other tub you know to make that square with the walls 
you're going to have this, you know, if you're half inch off on the front of that tub, you don't want those towels to be uneven in front. Your, your whole visual point is going to be that tub. So reference it off of that and forget everything else. As long as everything else, um, you know, I mean, obviously you don't want slivers, but uh, really just make it simple on yourself, especially in these smaller bathrooms in a five, it's only 30 square feet of tile reference that tub and then move from there it just makes everything a lot easier you don't have to overthink it and and get chalk lines and you know get a laser set up for anything you know those are for those big bathrooms if you're doing a you know a 20 by 16 bathroom then that's where you might want to consider like all those different angles but on this your main reference point is going to be that tub I believe this one's almost three quarters of an inch out of square, but it doesn't really matter. Don't even concern yourself with that. Just pay attention to the tub. And what I would recommend is just measuring your whole distance of your tub. So 58 and a half. So we'll be at uh, 29 or 28. What the hell would that be? Now, Alex, I couldn't agree with you more. Basically man. 29 inches, 29 and a quarter inches to the center. So Start just find your stuff center. And get corrected on things. And then we're doing 12 by 24 And I've learned tile. a lot. So typically, put myself if you just go straight sure. off the center, you're going to work out fine. You're going to basically have a couple of six-inch pieces on the other side. But one thing you want to pay attention to is the doorway and making sure that you have a full enough tile going into, into the doorway. Now, this is a little bizarre because they have the, do the door swinging out into the hallway. So we're going to be bringing tile all the way into that door jam. Typically, you're only going to right about here because you don't want to see towel on the outside of the door but in this instance um, the door is covering the outside it is a little bit so weird we but you know what i'm starting out. to so see this a lot more now these days different but you just want with to make the door sure. swinging out and that's mainly because for elderly people um if they fall if they fall in the bathroom and they're pinned against the door you can't open up the door to help them out so i've been seeing this more and more often now and i think it makes a lot of sense especially if you're concerned about an elderly parent that, um, you know, if they fell inside of the bathroom, you want to be able to get into that room. So I do see this more often now, but yeah, pay attention to where your door is. And I would recommend just ending that tile uh, so that's underneath the door. You don't want to see the carpet on the inside and you don't want to see tile on the outside. So just pay attention to how your door is swinging and, and go from there. That you're not going to have to have a small piece at the doorway. So just measure over and yeah, we got it. A 10 inch piece there so that's going to work fine but just hand lay them out you know it's really going to be personal preference but the one one rule that the tcna has which is the towel council of north america um is anything over 15 inches long you want to set on a third pattern so in the 12 by 24 it's recommended to go eight inches and 16 inches as far as your joints so it's st staggering your joints on a third pattern. And the main reason for that is it, it helps with lippage. Lippage is considered the difference between the edges of the, of the tile when you set them. If you set them in the middle, and you can even take a look at down, down the, the length of your, your tile and see if there's any type of bow on it. This isn't really all that too bad, but the more bowed it is, the harder it is to keep the lippage from one tile to the other on a staggered pattern. So that's why you wanna go with the, the third pattern. That's gonna minimize that curvature in the center. But always pay attention to that. And the other thing you wanna pay attention to is the squareness of the edge. And the only reason you wanna pay attention to that is for your grout joint sizing. Because if you have a spacer or a, um, a wedge, or like we're gonna be using a T, uh, T lock, uh, a uh, yeah. So this a leveling system right here is a and if the spacer, spacer if, if if the side of your tile is more bowed at the bottom, then when you put that spacer in, you're going to have a bigger grout joint on the top. So just pay attention to the edge of your tile. I always go with clips that are one thirty second, so then I can move uh, the tile around. I, I prefer sixteenth inch grout joints. To me, that just looks. Um, better so it really it's up to you on the on the grout size but um yeah just double check when you lay this out that you're approximately even on the other side so we got a six inch piece there and a five and three quarter inch piece there so that works out well now with length width wise 
I would say anything less than four inches is going to look like you didn't really plan out very well. So that's all you really want to pay attention to there. So we'll just measure the full width of this, which is 61. So 30 and a, 30 and a half is our center mark. And let's just see what we end up with here. So that's a seven inch piece. If it's, as long as it's um, not like, I mean, if it was, uh, what do you want to say? Um, Basically, if this was like eight and a half inches, that's not going to work out well because the third pattern that you do, you don't want to have a sliver next to the top. But in this instance, when you offset this by eight inches, you're going to have a, a 15 and a half inch piece there. And then you'll be even offsetting it even more at this level. So eight inches here. So you have like a 23 inch piece here. So everything's going to work out well as far as having a full piece up against that tile um, against the tub i should say basically if this was oh. like eight and a half inches that's not going to work out well because the I'm third pattern that. I, that, I guess i'll have to fix that video i didn't realize i had that duplicated in there hmm. 23 inch piece yeah, so 23 inch piece, it's tough to cut on a towel okay. cutter. So again, we're just gonna, gonna want to use a towel to for something like that. For squareness. But let's find the center of our toilet plant here. So we got 11 and 5 eighths. And it's a 7 inch toilet plant. So I'll go from the tub over, about 14 inches. It's gonna be three. A seven inch diameter hole. Yeah, keep in mind, toy flanges, they don't have this has to be perfect. It just exactly. has to be, you can't be too wildly over, but the most toilets will cover quite a bit. I would say if you're more than three quarters of an inch, you're gonna wanna cut another piece. Okay, so this is a Montelit, um, STL blade. So this is all diamonds all the way around this whole thing. And this really makes it nice for cutting holes in tile and ceramic. And I got a chip. Oh, that <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what it's. Spend all that time measuring that out and then that happens. Okay, so this STL blade has diamonds all the way around on each side. So it really makes it nice to cut holes in tile because you can just kind of grind your way down rather than having to deep dive and cut because it's going around in circles is kind of tough with a four and a half inch grinder but if you can just sand it down and get it much easier yeah you know and i used to i used to use a regular grinder but in order to do a circle you always had to take the, the guard off and uh i really don't advise that you see too many guys doing that um you know when you start seeing some of these diamond now that that stl blade it has diamonds all the way around it. I feel pretty comfortable with that, but when you're getting those blades that have like ridges on the edges and it's just a towel blade, if any of those ever shattered, and, I, and I've seen um, some images of some guys that have had their blades break on them and they didn't have any guards on their you know, on their grinders. And that scared me enough to go back to having a, a guard on my grinder. Um, you know, it can be extremely dangerous with some of these grinders. And, you know, one thing I found out uh, from doing videos for the last seven or eight years is that most of these manufacturers that make these blades, they won't even tell you how to use them. They, they don't even get into the, 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 um, the concept of how to cut with them because really you shouldn't be cutting circles with any grinder blade, technically, I guess. Um, or at least the companies aren't going to warrant that type of use of it. They basically just say, hey, you can just cut this straight and that's it. I could be wrong on that, but from what I can tell, it, you know, even referencing the way that I just use this. Now, the, the, the STL plate is a little bit different because you're kind of grinding down the tile. So I feel like it's a, a lot safer of a type of a grinder um, diamond blade than a standard uh, regular blade. So I don't know. Take it for what it is, but use your guards. You don't want to <laughs> – you definitely don't want to have a lifelong problem of having one of these grinder blades blow up on you. But when you're in the industry long enough, um, 
you know, you lose things just like fingers. So be careful out there. And that's the monster cutter again. So I really just like to have this all set up uh, so that the next day I can just immediately get into the tiling. Because really what I, you know, this bathroom, it was basically two days worth of tiling. That's basically what I had set up for it. So I know a lot of you guys, that's going to probably possibly take longer to do that. You might be getting into a lot more intricate towel work. This is where I like to use that fine tool uh, with the, uh, the shroud. It keeps down the dust and I can cut everything in the bathroom. So I pretty much just had most of the bathroom laid out and then I just finished off the rest. Uh, because I don't want to do the door cut jam side yet until I have that tile laid out so I can get more accurate. But that's kind of the finished um, look of what that tile looked like. And that's what we're striving for is we're striving for this new bathroom. So uh, and then in my course here, I just kind of reference all these same things again to keep you from wasting your time of watching another video. This is why I really think this course is worth it. Um, not just because I'm, you know, putting so much effort into it, but you can just get in here and just, you're not watching ads. You're not getting distracted. Uh, I know when I'm on YouTube, I get notifications from all the other places I follow and the ads distract you and you don't have things like this where you can just kind of quickly reference and get on with what you're doing. So I feel that this is going to keep you focused. And you, if you, if you get into this, this is going to work on your phone. I mean, this is teachable.com. It's a, it's a very user-friendly site. So um, you know, now internet service, on the other hand, that's, you know, that might be an issue for some of you, but I just kind of go over the basic points, you know, make sure you evaluate that door transition, make sure that, uh, you check out the sizing of how you're going to lay it out. I mean, these are all simple things, but you don't want to forget about it. before you order those clips. If you're going to use leveling clips, which I highly advise, I think it makes it a lot easier to install tile with them especially as these tiles keep getting bigger and bigger, you almost can't install them without leveling systems. So check that edge of that tile. Make sure that whatever grout joint that you want is going to fit there. Now, I, again, I always get the 132nd inch clips. I think that they're the best um, system. Now, I have this link uh, in the description. This is just a, a 300 uh, spacer kit. This will probably... Yeah, no, this will definitely do the floor. There's no question about that. I'm, I'm, I'm considering if you did 12 by 24s on the walls, this kit should be able to have enough clips if you were to do your whole tub surround in 12 by 24s. I shouldn't have a problem with it. They only have 100 wedges, though. So I highly doubt any of you probably would get the entire tub surround done in a day. But the, the wedges are reusable, and then you can buy additional clips. Um, if needed, but these little kits are reasonable. I think 85 bucks is not very much, um, for a full bathroom job, but I would probably only use these on 12 by 24s or bigger tile. Um, you can use them on 12 by 12s. No problem. That's even if anybody uses 12 by 12s anymore. Um, but yeah, pay attention to the edge of your tile and how much it's bowing. A lot of these 48 inch, these huge pieces of tile now, I mean, they can be tremendously curved and that's going to make you, you know, decide whether you want to go with the third pattern or the half pattern. Um, so I kind of just highlight that and then going through the cutting. Now this is, you know, again, cutting uh, tile circles and stuff. There's so many different methods, the way to go about it, but I found this to be, you know, the easiest way to go about it. And you just lay everything out and get everything ready for the next day. But then I have a whole bunch of things. If you're a con, if you're a towel contractor, I highly recommend that you buy a um, handbook from the TCNA or join the NTCA um, because they will, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get this book for free when you when you go to the end, you know, you join the association. Um, but it's also just they'll, they'll always they send you out these um, towel letter magazines every month. And it just keeps you up to date with the whole system. So I highly um, recommend the NTCA. Actually, I'll put a link down here below f for that um, when I get off here because I think it's important to, um, if you're a contractor, to be a part of an association that's going to keep you up to date with the rules. Now, the trial that I use for floors is uh, a Euro notch trial. So you can see how that has a kind of a funky um, trial size. I think this is this gives you the thinnest layer of thin set, but also gives you 
plenty of room to be able to level things out. So I primarily use this for 12 by 24 inch tiles. Um, and you know, you have to have a fairly flat floor. If you, if you're flat, if your if your floor is a little bit uneven in any way, you know, you might want to move into the half inch by half inch notch trial, but I have all these different, um, helpful links in the description. This is basically just for reference. I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm just simply showing you the tools that I've collected over time and, and what makes things easy to, um, to do this all with. So the last step of the day, now this is something that you can do at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day, but I like, you know, I, I kind of suggested this at the end because I don't want you messing around with too much time on this mosaic. I'd rather you see you get that tub surround put together and then move on to this. But in, in the real life scenario, when I was doing this, after I did the Dietra mat system, or put down the Dietra, I actually went ahead and, and started thin setting down this mosaics. This is going to save you a lot of time the next day if you embed these, especially these new mosaics. And I'll be explaining that in this video too. These these new mosaics that they keep coming out with, with glass, they keep getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And they're really hard to work with. And they're, uh, if you're trying to set them on the wall uh, without having a backing like this, it, it's like it's very, very frustrating. So I think this is a really great way to go about um you know being prepared for that that border of the next day and i i've been doing this now for a couple of years but i use this on any type of mosaic i i shouldn't say that the, the next shower that i'm going to be putting out i didn't because they were just standard two by two tiles so they were you know those are easy enough to put spacers in and, and get buffed out but you know anything else it's great to put on a membrane makes it a lot easier to install so we'll get into this I'm going to check my live chat here. Eddie, good to see you here. Thanks for coming if you're uh, if you're still on. Boy, we're almost getting up to two hours here. It's amazing how the time flies. Uh, so let's get into this mosaic. This is the last part of day four. Um, and this is going to set you up for a success the following day. Okay, so we got some mosaics that we're going to incorporate into the border. I highly recommend either the night before um, to set some of this because this is so thin, I mean, these days the glass keeps getting thinner and thinner, so it's never going to match up with any tile that you use. So this is really, really thin, and it's very delicate, so it's really difficult to embed this into thin set on the wall uh, without getting it all the way through all the joints. So the solution to that is, is to use some of the membrane, Schluter membrane, and you're basically going to be adhering it onto this so that you can just take the full sheet and you can embed as much thin set behind this and build it out to your layer. So it makes it a lot easier and you're not having to scrape any thin set out of these joints. So uh, basically we were gonna go with like a, at the max we were gonna go with a four inch border. So we can, I would just go with whatever your widest width you plan to go with. Yeah. So. This, you know, this goes into our towel layout um, section here. And we really went into depth here on the mosaics. But this is where if you have the, the largest amount, I always recommend, I mean, obviously getting an extra sheet of the mosaic for whatever you're doing. So if you needed usually like three sheets of this does fine. I think it's three. Yeah. So if I had um, three sheets, yeah, I have nine piece that but yeah so basically four sheets i'm sorry four sheets i usually tell the client to order five sheets of this so that i have enough ability to make this border bigger if i had to and the reason that you know you want to make this the maximum width that you can is so that in case that you were running into a problem with your tile layout you can just add and you know and make it like four and a half inches and make it so that you don't have that sliver at the ceiling so i like to have this as my exit strategy to installing the tile and no one's going to know the difference um, now it depends on the type of border you might not have that flexibility depending on all what you're using but in this type of tile um, you know make it the make put the border down as big as you can and then you can cut it down to the size that you want and cut them down so we got the tub surround back area which is going to be five foot So you definitely would want to, you know, make each section so that you can just have one piece that you set in. So that whole five foot area would have to be all side of our tub put surround, together, which is basically just 
three of these. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, stupid music. I got to take that off again. Sorry, you guys can't listen to the music or I'll get copyright claim. I just wanted this to be more digestible. Some of this, you know, without anything on it can be a little bit boring. But, you know, just basically cutting your curdy band this the size. And I just have a piece of drywall to put this underneath. This is actually the foyer of the room, and I let it sit there overnight. But um, using a uh, Dietra trowel, which is basically a 3 16th inch notch trowel, I, you know, I re definitely recommend getting a, a 3 16th inch notch trowel if you're doing... Uh, Ditra for your underlayment and you can use that to set your mosaics it's a it's a good size trowel for that but as you can see my consistency of the the um thin set is pretty loose here i want to make sure it's well bonded with that mosaic and then you obviously have to clean up your substrate this is you know you can see how much of a mess i am when i do this stuff but it's just a matter of about getting things done that's really what i'm about is efficiency i'm not too overly concerned about <laughs> the mess just what the end product looks like is what matters so you get okay, them set so up now you can see that i have everything evenly done now you don't want to have this sticking on your drywall so make sure you wipe underneath it before you set these in place but then we'll just set these into the thin set I think the first person I saw do this was Sal the Blasi. He, uh, I don't remember where he did this, but I was like, wow, that is a great idea. Putting this on the membrane so makes this all so much float. easier. So just use a grout and float, embed, embed it. And then make sure that everything stays in, in line with one another. So cleaning, cleaning off that curdy band awesome. membrane, you don't have to get rid of that curdy membrane you can cut so that off the next morning after everything dries knife, all that membrane off of there and then if you wanted to shrink this you could just simply cut it down whatever width you want but i'm just making it my maximum width because we weren't sure if we were going to go with a three or four inch border so yeah just using a, some kind of a straight edge it's a good idea. These things are thin though. I would not want to be hanging these on the wall without having them in the membrane. Okay, so then you'll be ready for the next day. And here I just have the same concept, basically giving you some reference points to, to remember uh, as far as putting all this together. So, but you know, as far as the trowel size, that really depends on your coverage, but most of the time a three sixteenth inch notch trowel works for most of those mosaics pretty well. And, um, yeah, so that's just kind of a quick reference to everything and you'll be ready to go. And, uh, again, if you ever had a comment or a question, you can always add a picture here and I can try to help you out with your questions. So that really kind of wraps it up, uh, for tonight i mean we've been out here for almost two hours thanks for everyone joining me leroy uh what, did you, what was your question here you had uh can you use a floor drain for a shower walk-in shower i'm assuming you're trying to do something in a basement if you had a floor drain most likely no you would not be able to adapt to that correctly um you know you're definitely going to want to probably dig up that floor drain and attach a, whatever waterproofing system that you're going to be installing um most likely a, a schluter system is probably going to be the easiest um depends on you know there's a lot of different ways I, actually i'm going to have a whole bunch of videos out here soon that are going to be comparing two different systems uh the weedy system and the schluter system and why i go one versus the other i don't always just go with one system and just stick with it because there's different scenarios that make one easier over the other and there's also price um points that you have to be considered as well um no doubt like we the weedy system is you know a fairly expensive system 
So, you know, sometimes it's just not in the budget to do so. And, it, and if you can accomplish that with a different system, it'll be a little bit easier. But yeah, floor drains, I mean, you're not going to be able to really um, waterproof properly to an existing drain like that. You're going to have to dig that up, attach something new to it, and then put your, your new drain on top of it. And that's actually one of the things I'm really ex hoping to get um, together sometime this year. I want to do a bathroom in a basement. I, f I see so many people kind of moving in together because the housing market has gone crazy and people can't afford, um, you know, especially the younger people. I feel bad for them with all the debt that they have with student loans. They probably can't even afford to get a mortgage and the prices of real estate, you know, at least here in Pittsburgh have gone up 30% across the board. So, you know, even if an interest rate's at 2%, it's still, it's still a hefty price tag to buy for things. And it's concerning. I feel like this is the same market that we were in in 2008 um, where things just didn't make any sense. And, you know, it all, all of a sudden got recorrected pretty quickly. So, I mean, I'm hoping that doesn't happen. But, you know, with these prices keep going up the way they are, I think that, um, you know, <laughs> remodeling your own bathroom is your only choice. You can't, you can't, you can only borrow so much money. And I think, you know, typically just so you, you know, just to go over some of this reference point. No, nope, that's not it. I, I kind of clicked out. I'll have to go through my whole system to find that. But, you know, like this bathroom that I that we did here is 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 about a, a $15,000 bathroom if you had a contractor doing it. Now, material wise, I am going to get through a lot of that. Um, you know, at the end of this course, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that. I'm going to itemize everything and give you the exact cost of what everything was. But typically in a standard bathroom like this, you know, you're going to be under five grand for materials. So you can save yourself a considerable amount of money by doing this yourself. And, uh, and I think I do have the map and the plan that will help you out the best. So, um, I'll probably leave it here tonight. Thanks, Troy, for being here as always, man. I, I really love the support and I'm really happy to see your progress as well. I'm really excited to see what that will all turn out to be. But you can follow me on social media. I, I am active on that as well, um, on Instagram, on TikTok, all those places. But uh, real, you know, if you can uh, help me out with YouTube by sharing this with somebody, uh, sharing this video, giving me a like, subscribing, all those things kind of make that algorithm push me out there a little bit. But um, thanks so much for joining me tonight. And uh, I will, let me see if there's any one other comment I had or anything I would address before the end of the night. Um, yeah, that should be it. So my plan is, is to work on day five, probably all day tomorrow. I probably won't have a live stream tomorrow. I'll probably do that on Thursday. Um, but again, my plan is to have this course done by the end of the year. So check in the comments here. I'll have a link to the, uh, to the course. And um, yeah, so thanks so much, guys. I'll talk to you soon.